So we move into this new chapter on structural analysis. This is probably one of my favorite chapters, although there's a lot of favorite chapters in the book, but especially when we get down to the end of it on frames and machines. But today we're going to be able to talk about trusses in two-dimensional trusses, and there's two methods for analysis, analyzing a truss. One is called the method of joints, and the other is the method of sections. So those two methods are all used for 2D trusses. But then everything's really in 3D, so then we get to space trusses. All right. And then the, today I th think we'll be able to get through space trusses, and I don't think we'll get into frames and machines, but that's a, a, a great section. So what is a truss? Well, it's made up of long, slender members that are linked together, or they're sometimes welded, sometimes pins, sometimes gusset plates or other things bolted together. But um, basically, we're going to treat it and analyze it as if those long, slender members are pin connected. That's an approximation. All right, analysis. So when we analyze it, we're going to analyze where... Uh, the joints are, and that's the only place the loads are placed. Everything's going to be concentrated on those joints where those long slender members come together. And again, they're pin connected at the joints, and because they're pin connected, long slender, there's, everything's at the joints, nothing's in the middle, it's, they're all two force members. If they're a two force member, they're either in tension or compression along that line of action. That's it. So it's pretty simple. Uh, trusses are very, very widely used. Often they are named after the original designer. So sometimes they'll say, oh, this is a Pratt truss. Pratt truss? What's Pratt? The name of the inventor, this original designer. Uh, they, are, they go back way far. Uh, there's a lot of history in trusses and, and structural analysis. Uh, they were with wood, a lot of wood and then cast iron and then steel and different materials uh, to use to make trusses. So you can just do a quick Google search and take a look. Oh, there's a how truss. That's the configuration. Or the Pratt truss. That's the type of configuration. Or the Warren truss, a different type of configuration. I just grabbed a couple of these. So long, slender members that are joined together like that. Okay. Here, like this, long slender members connected. Uh, there's a lot of disasters associated with bridges, basically built with trusses. Uh, I don't know if in the engineering intro to engineering class exposed you some of the disasters or bridge failures. Uh, a lot of times, it's when a train is going across, and um, it's not too uncommon to lose quite a few people. What year was this? 1879. This was a disaster that took 75 people's lives on a bridge collapse. Uh, there's another one. This one was typically when it's cold and some of the material is cast iron, more brittle. Um, train goes over dead of night and you have a collapse. And this is the Ashtabula train disaster. It was the worst in the United States history in the U.S. And how many people died? Um, nearly 100 were killed when that Ashtabula train bridge uh, collapsed. Okay. You could find a lot on it. And it was, uh, what, 140 years ago, um, marked in 2016. And so there's, you can visit these sites where there's big disasters like battlefields and take a look at memorabilia and pictures. Uh, 1980, um, in Tampa, Florida, uh, there was a disaster, but it was because somebody uh, smacked up against the, the base of it and weakened it, and then it led to the disaster. And a number of people went off and died in this one. And this lucky soul, his car stopped with, I think, one wheel hanging over. So um, th 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 things do happen. All right, so trusses. We're now going to analyze trusses, and we're going to first uh, analyze them using the method of joints. So what is the joint? That's where the truss 
members come together, and that's where the loads are applied in our analysis. Um, we want to talk about, or typically want to analyze it to compute the force in each of the members. That force could be a tension force or a compression force, and the magnitude is what we typically want to analyze and come up with. So what do we do? We construct a free body diagram of each joint, and then we typically assume all of the members are in tension, meaning they're pulling away from that joint. And if you later calculate the magnitude as some negative value, well, then you say, oh, it was in compression. It's actually pushing toward the joint or into the joint. And again, you have loads at the joints, and then you also have supports for the truss on the ends and somewhere in the middle sometimes. So two force equa equilibrium equations per joint, the sum of the forces in the x have to equal zero at that joint and the sum of the forces in the y equal to zero. Now because a joint to point, there's no moment right there. We may use moment for the whole truss, but not at the particular joint. Okay. So you start typically when if you're using the, the method of joints you solve for essentially the, the, the force in each member, all of the members, and then when we get to the method of sections, it's a little more uh, surgically um, precise, like which members are you really interested in? Let's just solve for those. This one's kind of brute force, the method of joints, solving for all of the unknowns. What you're going to look for when you start to see them are zero force members, meaning that it's neither in tension or compression. Well, why is it in a truss? Well, that's a good question because the loads could change or maybe it needs to be loaded in a place, particular way to be put into place. And, uh, and sometimes you have these members which under lo certain load conditions don't have any tension or compression in them but are important. Let's uh, solve this problem. So determine the force in each member of the truss. When you see that wording in each member of the truss, you think, well, method of joints. How many joints do I have? I have a joint at A, a joint at B, a joint at uh, E, a joint at C, and a joint at D. There's five joints. All right. So what are the members of this truss? Well, here is uh, one member. Uh, let's say it's A to B. It's between joint A and B. And then this is another member, uh, B to C, another member, I don't know, C to E, another member, A to E, uh, another member, E to D, and another member, C to D. So they want you to calculate the force in each member of the truss. So how many unknowns are we expected to solve for? All right, hopefully everybody had time to, con to consider that. So you want the force in each member. How many members are there? It's really just counting the members. Isn't there one? Well, I put, listed them up here. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Or one, I forget, the, that's two, then three. Did I miss one right here? Four, five, six. Seven. Hey, you're on top of it then. There was seven. That wasn't supposed to be a trick question. I just failed to list the member, which was B to E. True? And that gives us seven. How many? Well, did it ask for the reaction forces? You can calculate a lot of things, but they're unknown, but if you only are asked for, I mean, so when you put in a box, we're looking for seven things that go inside of a box, which are there. I'm going to count six and seven correct. Oh, why not? Just call them all correct. There you go. <laughs> Everybody's correct today. How's that? Sound better? There you go. You may want to have some nomenclature like uh, the force in member A to B, subscript A, B, or the force in B, C, or the force in C, E, and the force in A, E, and the force. Sometimes it's just the notation is cumbersome. What exactly are we looking for? The force. What are we going to assume is the positive? It's intention. That's, believe me, the best way to go. 
You assume everything is in tension. You say, that's ridiculous. Some of these I can tell are going to be in compression. Fine, work with negative numbers on some of them. But this is a good strategy. Assume the force is the tension force. That's what we're asking to solve for in each of the members. All right. Uh, now, uh, assume that each joint is a pin. Otherwise, forget it. It's going to be too difficult for us. Next class, right? Next class. This is just statics, the beginning. And that P is 4 kilonewtons. So right here, the load at this A is 4 kilonewtons. This one's 8 kilonewtons because it's 2P. And this is uh, 4 kilonewtons. Notice the loads are at the joints, which is good. All right, so method of joints. What we do is you come in here and you'll do a free body diagram of joint A. So here is joint A, and I'm going to run out of room. So there's a lot of these joints we have to analyze. Let's introduce our coordinate system, which, I mean, a lot of times I don't even write that coordinate system, but X is horizontal running to the positive to the right. Y is vertical running positive up. And then we're going to have a load at that joint. Uh, that's a 4 kilonewton load. And then we're going to have this member A to E. No, that's A to B. And so this is the tension in member A to B, or force A to B. That's consistent with, with our no, notation that we decided to use. The tension force in member A to B. And then we also have another one, which is the force A to E. And we all, we, we, we observe that A to B is along the x-axis. That's great. But if you look at it, there's a particular triangle, isn't it, right here? And we like to pick off things with those triangles. So it looks like the run is larger than the rise or the drop. And we look at it, it looks like a 4 for the run. What does it look like for the drop? Can you figure out what this is right here? Clicker question, 30 seconds. What is the value right there on this little triangle, this similar triangle? It's got a 4 for the horizontal. What's the vertical? All right. So let's punch it in. Let's see what we got. It's a 2. It's a 2. Because it's a half of four, this point is halfway down. I mean, and that was a four right there. So this is two meter and two meter. All right. So this this is a four two. Okay. What is the hypotenuse? This this is not a three four five tri triangle, but it's a, a, a two four something. What is the hypotenuse? Square root of square root of 20 or you could write it like this you could put uh, one, uh, one two square root of five either one it's just those are similar triangles are they not aren't we experts at right triangles all right so I'm gonna go ahead and I'll put one I'm going to put 2 and the square root of 5. That's my similar triangle. Help me pick off those components quickly. Now, if we say for equilibrium, for equilibrium, we have the sum of the forces in the uh, y direction. That's going to yield one equation with one unknown. And if I do that, I have negative 4 coming down. So that's why I put a negative sign on it. And then I have minus. 1 over the square root of 5, picking off that component of F A to E equal to 0. Is that a good equilibrium equation? You say you got two negative signs. They're confusing. Well, be very careful with the negative signs in this whole section, in the whole class, but especially in this section. You assume everything's in tension. Stick with it. Now... Uh, how about you calculate F A to E and then give it to me in three significant digits.
All right. Well, hopefully that was enough time. Let's take a look. First of all, um, hmm, uh, somebody I heard him hurt say, I think that member's in compression. If it's in compression, should F A to B be positive or negative? Negative. Negative. If it's in compression. And if you look at it, if I have a load here pushing down, uh, the only thing that's going to help is something here pushing back up. The member is going to be in compression. I know it takes a while to develop that insight. So, but, but that will help you a lot. It's just like, oh, I'm going to look for a negative answer. But you just do the math. You flip this to the other side. then you. So it's going to be the square root of 5 times 4 with that negative. And so this comes in at negative uh, 8.94. Uh, what are the units on this? Kilonewton. So F A to E uh, with a negative 8.94 kilonewton. Or you could write F A to E is equal to 8.94 kilonewton in compression. The book uses this parenthesis C to say, oh, it's in compression. So let's take a look. Well, that's the right answer. Okay. Now, that gives us that one. How about if we do the, the, the sum of the forces in the X for this equation, right? Uh, for this node, this, this uh, I didn't label it A, did I? Joint A. Okay. Some of the forces in X will allow us to calculate that member's um, of um, tension force. So what do we get? We get, just looking at our free body diagram, the force A to B in the positive. And then this is where it, it, it treat this F A to B as A to E as positive, and you'd pick off one square root of five times F A to E equal to zero. Did I take this? Free body diagram, do the sum of the forces and x equal to zero. And did I write that equation correctly? And then what we do is we say f a to b is negative 1 over the square root of 5 times, uh, you're right, it's 2. That's what you're looking at. 2, negative 2 over square root of 5 times f a to e. I substitute negative 2 over the square root of 5 times negative 8.94 kilonewton, and F A to B comes in at 8 kilonewton. True or false? So is this member in tension or compression? I should have put that inside the box, right? F A to B is Positive 8 kilonewtons, meaning this member's in tension. Think about it. You're loading it on that tip. It's going to want to come down. That member in the top's in tension. The member in the bottom's in compression. Hopefully that makes sense. Look good? All right. So you solved for two of those unknowns using the method of joints. Only joint A has been used. Let's go and do a free body diagram of joint B. I want you to draw it. I'm going to pause and walk around. And coming away from the joint is the three tensions in each of those three members that link into joint B. Right? Because the, the member from A to B is assumed in tension. The member from B to E is assumed in tension. And from B to C is assumed in tension. All right. I'm going to pause, walk around, see what you do. All right, so let me go ahead and pick it up. What I'm going to have to do is scroll down, and so then you'll be like, you hopefully you have some good notes because I'm going to lose this image. Uh, but that's just what is, is going to have to happen. So we have a joint, B, and we have the load coming down. What was that, 8 uh, kilonewton? And then we have the member, the force in tension of that member from B to what, E? And then we have the force B to C and the force B to um, A. And you say, I just solved for this, didn't I? 
theta a, that's equal to positive 8 kilonewton in tension. So the direction of this arrow on my free body diagram for joint B is correct. That's good. And a lot of you, the number one thing is they said, well, if this one's pushing down, this one's going to be pushing up. But please just don't do it. Recommended to stay away from that. What you're going to do is you're going to solve for now, if we do the equilibrium equation in the Y, that's what you were doing in your head, a lot of you. If you do the sum of the forces in the Y must equal to zero, you have negative 8 kilonewton down from the load. And you have negative force B to E down from the tension in that member, B to E. That's equal to zero. You conclude force B to E is negative 8 kilonewton. So that member is in compression. But when we go down to the next joint, which is the joint down at E, it's better to just assume everything that's connected to it are all in tension. All right. Now let's do the sum of the forces in the x equal to 0. What do we calculate? That the force B to C is in the positive. The force A to B or B to A. I, I don't, you know, A to B or B to A, that subscripts, the order of them is your choice. I just will change them up. It's the same member, okay? All right. That's equal to 0. What did I do here? This is minus F A to B is 0. So this force B to C is equal to a, neg a positive F A to B. And that is force B to C is 8 kilonewton in tension. Good? All right. I have to go back and look at my diagram. Now I have a choice. Do you want to go to... C, or you want to go down to D, or you want to go over to E. Which one do you want to go to? Okay. You don't care? It's fine. Let me do this. If you count, you just turn this for, uh, into a known. This is K-N-O-W-N. This one is the, the, the force and member B to C. You just calculated it. It's now known. The one here, the fifth element, and the seventh are still unknown as well as the reaction at the support. That's unknown. You haven't calculated it yet. So even if you get your a good um, free body diagram for C, some of the forces X, some of the forces, you'll get two equations with three unknowns. You, you'll be stuck, which is fine. You'll just then go and get another equation from a different, but it won't come from uh, that joint C, it'll come from the tr entire truss analysis of the entire truss or something. Let's do this. Um, uh, let's go down here. Did we just solve for this member's... Yes, we just solved for that one. We just solved for this one, did we not? How about this one or this one? You know what? If I analyze E, I can get two equations with two unknowns. So let's do E. Does that make sense? So write a free body diagram for joint E and then do the equilibrium equations for it in hopes of solving for the force from E to C and the force from E to D. When you get the free body diagram, call me over. Joint E. All right. So let me try and maybe sketch it up here. I'll try to leave that illustration in there. So we're going to do the free body diagram. Uh, let's do the free body diagram for joint E. So I'm, I'm going to get tired of putting in my little XY coordinate system, but it's helpful at the beginning. So here's our joint E, and then we're going to have the tension or the force and tension from A to E. And that little similar triangle is a uh, 1, 2, square root of 5. So I can pick off that component. Then I have the force and tension. That's not in a good location. Put it over here. The force going from B to E completely in the Y. Then we have the force 
uh, from C to E. And that little triangle is going to be uh, 2, 1, square root of 5. And then coming down here, we'll have the force from uh, E to D. And again, uh, it's a 2, 1, square root of 5. Hopefully it's not too cluttered. Hopefully it makes sense. Let me just ask, do you did, do I have a problem with with it or do you like it? Thumbs up if you like it. Couple thumbs up. Look okay. All right. So now we do this equilibrium equation. Some of the forces and the x must be equal to zero. So we'll pick off a negative two divided by the square root of five times f a to e. We'll pick off a plus two divided by the square root of five. F C to E and plus 2 divided by the square root of 5 F E to D equal to 0. Uh, all of these have 2 over square root of 5. True. And A to E we already solved for. A to E was negative uh, square root of 5 times 4 if you want to leave it that way. So this becomes negative of a negative square root of 5 times 4 plus um, uh, f c to e plus f e to d equal to 0. Unfortunately we have one equation with two unknowns, don't we? So how about the y equilibrium equation, some of the forces in the y. You pick off 1 over the square root of 5 times f a to e. You pick off f b to e. You pick off 1 over the square root of 5 f c to e minus 1 over the square root of 5 f e to d equal to 0. Thumbs up if you agree. And then we go ahead and substitute for our knowns. So we have 1 over the square root of 5 times. F A to E was negative square root of 5 times 4. And F B to E was uh, 8 um, kilonewton. Let's take a look at it. Where is the, I have it? Negative 8 kilonewton, negative 8. And then the rest of the equation, plus 1 over the square root of 5, f c to e, minus 1 over the square root of 5, f e to d equal to 0. At this point, I could clean it up. We, we, put the, we have basically two equations with two unknowns. And we have to solve for those two equations, two unknowns. How about uh, I pause, let you solve for f c to e. So that's what we're looking for. We want to solve for f c to e and f e to d. So please solve those two equations, two unknowns. Okay, uh, e to d, negative 8.94, is it kilonewton or units? Kilonewton. So one of the members is in compression. Makes sense. And one is in tension. So there you go. Those are two or more of the unknowns we've now solved for. And then uh, we have uh, to solve for uh, this member. Um, did we solve for B to C? Yeah, we did. So the last one, this member right over here. How do I solve for this last one, which is, um, I'll scoot down a little bit, C to D. That's the last unknown. How do you want to do it? If you wanted to solve for this one right here, 
first of all, can you are you getting better? Can you tell if it's in tension or compression? First of all, this member right here was in compression, right? So what about this member right here going vertical from C to D? Is it tension or compression? Well, if you do a free body diagram of joint D, maybe that's what I'm doing in my mind. It's, it's, I know that this is solved for, and we just said it was um, ah, negative 8.94 kilonewton. Negative 8.94 kilonewton. We have a reaction from the wall, a normal force from that wall. Let's call that what? Um, yeah. D in the X, and then this member is um, the force C to D, and we're going to assume it's in tension. Okay. Now, can you see what F? Because this is negative, it's actually pushing down on D. It's in compression. It'll be in tension, right? We'll have to pull up. So our last for joint D. Um, if you do the sum of the forces in the Y, you can avoid this DX, this reaction at the support, and uh, you'll find out that what was our little triangle here? It's a 2, 1, square root of 5. And so you pick off the um, um, 1 over the square root of 5 times this uh, negative 8.94 plus... F C to D is equal to zero. F C to D is four. And because it's positive, it's in tension. Okay, that's the method of joints. Uh, this was very painful, um, but it's if, if you're you just need to be tedious and accurate and don't. You know, pay attention to minus signs and directions, and don't just uh, assume that it'll all work out. You can easily have an error. Okay, now the other thing is, is did we solve for the reactions? Did I solve for this uh, dx? Uh, maybe did I solve for cx? And then also, even though there's a load on it, the pin has a support, maybe a cy. Did, I, did we do any of that? No. It'll help, actually, if you do that, and then maybe you can work by, to, from the joints that are next to those um, supports. But you would do a free body diagram of the entire truss and maybe solve for DX, CX, and CY, which is pretty easy to do. And then you could maybe work in. Okay? Here we started out at A and worked that way. You could start over here, D and C, and work to the left in that truss. Determine the force in each of the members of the truss and state if the members are in tension or compression. Well, I'm not going to solve the whole problem, but let's focus on this joint at E. If I do a free body diagram of E, what do I have? Do I have any load applied at that joint? No, this problem it doesn't. But I have uh, force and tension from E to A a force and tension from E to D, and a force and tension from E to F. And we do the sum of the forces in the Y must equal to zero, or a lot of times I'll just put Y colon, the equilibrium equation, sum of the forces in the Y. What do we conclude about the magnitude of F, E, A? This is a zero force member. And once you start seeing them, it's like, oh, yeah, I can see that. It's a zero-force member. Um, there's one other zero-force member in this. Don't shout it out. Click our question. And I'm going to go around and number them. This was the first one. And we said this is a zero-force member, so don't pick one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven eight or nine all right can you observe which one and then input the numeric value for that member is a zero force member talk to your friends i'll give you a little more time
All right, so let's take a look at what people put down. Uh, seven is that zero force member, is it not? S isn't seven? And you just look at it, it would be like nothing's pushing up at B. No external load pushing up. Uh, is five a zero force member? I don't think so. I think just from observation, seven is just by looking at if you'd looked at joint B and did some of the forces in the Y. All right. All right. Let's press forward. Method of sections. Uh, it's kind of like a lot of things. Um, you do method of joints before the method of sections. Method of joints, a little bit brute force. Typically, you solve for every member's force. But method of section is you have a big truss, you just solve for a few, not all, just select ones. So it's a very wise free body diagram that allows us to use this method of sections. And that wise free body diagram cuts the members of interest. And that's it. So here's a how bridge truss. So there's the name of the person. And it's subjected to the loading of 30, 20, 20, and 40 kilonewtons. Uh, it has a lot of members, does it not? It has a member, one A to J, and then J to I, that's the second one, and then A to I, and, you know, you can just count all these members. I'm glad that didn't say solve for all of the forces in each of the members. But they want to solve for the member HI, HB, and BC. So first of all, we have to find where they are. So this is the member HI. This is the member HB. This is the member BC. So you want to get a big free body diagram that cuts those three members. And it's not too surprising. You'll come in here, cut, 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 and then come around to close it out, cut through the air with the loads included, there you go. And that's your method of section. So you would come over here, you draw that isolated thing. The interior illustration is not that critical, but what you have is you have the support, AY and AX with a load of 30 kilonewtons, a load of 20 kilonewtons, and you're cut just to the side, just to the right of that joint at I. And you have then the tension force in member I to H. Just like here, you cut right there and right there. You have a tension force in member B to H. And you have a tension force in member B to C. That is a good free body diagram of the section on the left of my cut. Can you do me a favor? Cut. Cut, well, here you would cut right in here. Cut, 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 like that. Can you draw what the free body diagram is for the section on the left? I did it for the one on the right. Do the one on the left. Call me over when you get it. So let's see if I can sketch this one. So we'll have a kind of like this with uh, that, this, that. All right, and then we have the reaction at E, but it's only E and the Y, is it? There's no E in the X. Look at that um, support. It's a roller support there. And then we're going to have the tension force in uh, B to C, and we'll have the tension force in uh, B to H, and the tension force in uh, I to H, and then we have our load, our 20 kilonewton load at H, and our 20 kilo, no, 40 kilonewton load at G. Is it complete? Now you can go and do which right side, left side. Both are excellent, both will work. Okay, there's no difference. Um, let's do this, though. So if you were going to to solve for these three unknowns, one, two, three, all right, you're going to have to be a little careful, all right? Uh, first of all, can you solve for EY going back to a free body diagram of the entire truss? That's pretty easy to do. 
If you solve for EY, going back to the free body diagram and tire truss, what would I do around point A to be able to solve one equation, one unknown, to get EY? Some of the moments around point A. Will that allow us to get EY? That's going back to the entire truss. All right, so let's do this. If you do the sum of the moments about point A for entire truss, you'll pick up that the 30 kilonewtons goes through point A, no moment. The 20 kilonewtons has a moment arm distance of 4 meters. Isn't this 4 meter? making it want to rotate in the negative sense. And then the, the negative 20 times 8, negative 40 kilonewtons times 12. And then we're going to have a positive uh, EY times a, uh, 16 meters. That's equal to 0. Some of the moments. So what does that allow us to calculate EY to be? 45. 45 kilonewtons. Thank you very much. Now that I know that, now, okay. Now, how can I get one equation and one unknown and solve for, let's, let's solve first for B to C. One equation, one unknown, using this, this method of section, how could I get F, B to C, one equation, one unknown? I'm going to walk around and you tell me how to do that. Using this, knowing that, how do I... That's exactly right. So if you do the sum of the moments around this point H, then this F D to H or F B to H both go through point H. They can't generate a moment. Those two unknowns are still unknowns, but they're not unknowns in my equation. <laughs> so... Uh, let me scroll down a little bit. So here we do the sum of the moments around point H equal to zero. So what we find is that 20 kilonewton doesn't generate anything, but the 40 does, true? So the negative 40 kilonewton times a moment arm distance of 4 meters. Uh, I'm doing negative because it's going to make it want to spin in the clockwise and then we'll put minus F B to C times, I think that's also 4 meters, isn't it? 4 meters, yeah. This distance, moment arm distance for B to C. It then the E of Y makes it want to spin or rotate in the positive sense, the counterclockwise. And its moment arm distance is 8 meters. I pause. I said this one works, this contributes, this contributes, this contributes. Um, is that it? Did it? Is that e now equal to zero? And this one we know is a 45 kilonewton. This is the only unknown in the equation. Then you solve for that unknown. All right, at this point, in the interest of time, I'm going to leave that algebra up to you. But let's go back up to this illustration. Let's say this is now solved for. I want to get another equation with only, only um, this is the unknown in it. One equation, one unknown. With that as it, in it. And, and I don't want this one or that one in the equation. Where would I do the sum of the moments about? Somebody's sharp. Somebody did it pretty quick. Did you hear what they said? You would do the sum of the moments around point B. Why would you do the sum of the moments around point B? Hey, B is over here. It's not even in my... Yeah, but the line of action and the line of action go right through B. They don't contribute anything to the moment equation. But that point's not on my free body diagram for that section. Who said you had to do a sum of the moments about a point that's on the free body diagram? I mean, it, it's in the free body diagram, but it's not on my structure, I should say. So you can do the sum of the moments around this point, B, and the only unknown will be 
this force, tension force in member, um, what is that, I to H. Okay? Do you see how that game is played? So you did the sum of the moments around this point H. You could solve for F, B to C right away. You do the sum of the moments around point B, and boom, you could solve for uh, F, I to H right away. How about the B to H? Anybody want to offer a strategy to calculate B to H? Forces in the X. Kind of like you have your tool bag. You say, uh, uh, try some of the moments around a particular point. Some of the forces in the X, some of the forces in the Y. And if you do the sum of the forces in the X, you'll get that equation and be able to solve for it. Assuming you got the other ones calculated. You could also do some of the forces in the y. If you did the sum of the forces in the y equal to zero, do you need to first solve for the other two tension forces? They both are playing out in the x, aren't they? So you could solve for f, b to h first without knowing any of the other two unknowns by doing some of the forces in the y equal to zero. All right, in the interest of time, let me push forward. Space trusses, well, guess what that is? It's 3D. It has to rely a little bit more on the math. And you have now unit vectors in 3D, a little more challenging, a little more time consuming. So we did have a simple truss, a simple 2D truss. In a simple 2D truss, I forgot to emphasize, is built on triangles. The triangle is very sta st stable. And so you start putting triangles together, you know what? You've got yourself a pretty good truss. That's a simple truss. In 3D, a simple space truss, well, what's the cousin for the 2D triangle? Is the three-dimensional tetrahedral element. So what's that look like? Oh, point, 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 point. Uh, it's hard to draw. I guess that's my... Anyway, look in the textbook for a better rendition. 3D little building element, tetrahedral element. All right, so if you put those together, they're real stable. Might as well jump into it. Determine the force developed in each member of the space truss and state if the members are in tension or compression and the crate has a weight of 150 pounds. Well, this is a really hard one just to look at. Where are my, where's my origin and where are my X, Y, Z axes? Where's the origin at? Point A. Point A. And then the positive X is out this direction. Positive Y out that direction, positive Z out that direction. Uh, okay, that's good. So, um, hmm, let's do this. Let's try and see in 3D, um, is there a member, what, what member goes from this A to B? It's a little hidden right there, isn't it? Isn't that member A to B? All right. How about from B to C, that member? How about from A to C? So right away, there's three members are shown. I need to solve for at least three unknowns. How many additional members are there? Is there a member A to D? That would be a fourth member. And a member D to B? That would be a fifth member. And a member D to C? I would probably list those. I would probably say, you know what I'm asked to solve for? I'm asked to solve for the force A to B. Asked to solve for the force, tension force in A, uh, that's whatever. I, I did B to C, then force uh, A to C, then force A to D, then force B to D, and uh, force um, C to D. Are, are those six of them? So we, a lot of times when you're, when you're solving problems, you'll forget. Like, how many unknowns am I looking for? How, how many things am I trying to solve for? Six of them, and where they're at on the illustration. 
All right, because the three-dimensional information is very important, I would encourage you to go ahead and try to say, where is point A? Where is point B? Where is point C? Where is point D? And you'll sometimes go back and refer to that information again and again. So let me do this. Let me, I think you know what I'm asking you to do. What is the X, Y, Z location of each of those points in units all of foot? Foot, foot, and foot. Let me pause, walk around, fill that out. Let me see if you can read where those points are. Because if you can't, we're in trouble. We're in big, big trouble. There. Wow. So the origin was at A, so that's pretty easy. Then B, if you look at it, it's a negative 6 in the X, but 0 in the Y and 0 in the Z. C now, this is the harder one out here. Uh, but let's, let's do D first. Um, this is a right triangle coming down. It has a hypotenuse of 6 foot. And because it's split evenly, this is a 3 foot um, there. So the X for point D is a negative 3. And the Y is 0. And the Z, I have to calculate this. And then you just look at that right triangle and you say, oh, 3 squared plus, let's call this um, H. No, not H. Let's call it D. D squared is equal to 6 squared. Is that right for a right triangle? And then D is the square root of 27. I don't know how else. Some people got it right away. I was impressed. Is that the way your minds work? Pretty tough to get the square root of 27, which is 5.196 blah, blah, blah. All right. Now we know then that's the height, square root of 27. That's the same height as point C. And C has the same uh, X of negative 3, but it has a Y coming out of 6 foot. Ah, that's a challenge to get that all done. It really is. All right. Let's do this. This is going to help us in the long run. Can you give me the unit vector going from A to C, the unit vector from A to B, the unit vector from A to D, and the unit vector from, I don't know, B to D, and one more unit vector. I didn't leave enough room. I'll scoot them up just a minute. Uh, unit vector. Um, Unit vector, what? Um, B to C. And now these unit vectors, the first letter does make a difference. It's from this point to that point. I know this is a review of what we already accomplished so far this semester, but can you get those? Like from A to C, how would I write that? Well, I'm going to go out at negative 3 in the I, positive 6 in the J, positive square root of 27 in the K, and I have to normalize by the square root of 3 squared plus 6 squared plus 27, square root of 27 squared, which is 27. And I think if you do the 3 squared plus 6 squared plus 27, yeah, you get the 72. That's why on your paper when I saw that 72, it's like, how did you do that so fast? But that's right. That this and the, down here is the square root of 72. What is this representing right here? Can you see that? Why did they put that in? Is there a point, you know, G here or, or E there or F there? No, there's no point. It's not labeled, is it? But what is this little cup showing with this ball right there? They're showing you that it's firmly attached, isn't it, to some rest of the world surrounding? Okay. 
So what is what are they showing going from this firmly attached point to this point, this joint, this ball and socket? It's a ball and socket link, isn't it? What does that mean about this member right here, this, this little member? It's a two-force member. This is a two-force member. This back here is a two-force member. So they're showing you some two-force members. True? Okay. Now, is, is A somehow connected to the world, those surroundings, or is A only connected to two two-force members as well as the other members of my truss? It's only connected to these two two-force members which are then grounded. So, and this one can only have a force in it that's along a line of action from A to this other point in the X. And this one only there. So you could draw it, depending on if you wanted to, I could draw it like this. I could say this is AY and AX. What is AY and AX? That's, that's the forces of my two force members which ground it, which hold it in place. Um, is there a restraint? Is there a two force member which means that there would be a resistance AZ? You know, like a support where it could be non zero AZ? Nope, that's right, that is not. All right, let's take a look up there at D. What, a, what about point D? What does that little suction cup in the gray hash background look, make it look like? Tell me a little bit about point D. If I want to do an, a free body diagram of the entire truss, am I going to just cut through air around point D, or am I going to have to slice right through there? Slice right through there, and that's a constraint, and that's a ball and socket at D. The frame is the truss is connected to a ball and socket firmly attached to the surroundings at D. So if I cut and I do a free body diagram, just like I'm replacing these two force members with um, supports at A, I have supports at D. We would put D in the X. Just, okay, come on now, you can write. D in the Y, it's hard to show, D in the Y, as well as D in the Z. I'm, I'm making a, a three-dimensional entire free body diagram of the entire truss. Likewise, over here at B, we only have B in the Y. True? Not B in the X, B in the Z, just B in the Y. All right. Then I have this load, let's call it W. So if I make a free body diagram, entire truss, I have to have AX, AY, but not AZ. I have to have BY, but not BX, BZ. I have to have DX, DY, and DZ, all those three. And then I have W. Before we go in and solve for those interior forces in the members, you could, and it's probably helpful, to go ahead and solve for each of these unknowns. How many unknowns? AX, AY, DX, DY, DZ, and uh, I left BY out. Can you see that? Okay. Um, how would you solve maybe for, give me a strategy for solving for some of those. Some of the forces in the X, so AX plus DX equal to zero, right? Okay. Usually some of the moments allow you to knock a bunch of unknowns out and solve for some in particular. Do the sum of the moments about the x-axis. If you do the sum of the moments about the x-axis going through point A and through point B, doesn't the x-axis go through those two points? Then what generates a moment about the x? D, Y, but not D, Z, nor D, uh, X, just dy, and then what about this weight, w? Does it generate a moment? Sure. You can solve, you can solve for dy right away. All right. How did we do that? Some of the moments about the x-axis. All right. Um, 
Who wants to try another one? Which one do you want to do? You want to do some of the forces in the Z? Okay, if you do some of the forces in the Z, then DZ is solved for. Maybe I should put checks right here. We solve for DY. You'll solve for DZ. Some of the forces in the Z equal to zero. Some of the moments about the x-axis equal to zero. Okay. Hopefully that you that makes sense. Give me another one that you would try. If you do some of the moments about the Z axis, we can get rid of BY and we'll find BY. You'll find BY by the sum of the moments around the Z axis equal to zero. That makes sense? Hopefully you're getting good. You can start seeing these. Like, oh, now I know which one. Because we haven't used some of the moments around the y-axis, have we? If you use some of the moments around the y-axis, what are you going to solve for? dx. Some of the moments around the y-axis equal to zero. Solve for dx. AX, once I do that, I do the sum of the forces in the X equal to zero, solve for AX. And then sum of the forces in the Y, solve for AY. I'm skipping a lot of points to solve this quickly. Okay. <laughs> now that I have all these reactions, I need to do... Um, since they want it for every for each member, every member basically method of joints in 3D. All right, what does the free body diagram for joint A look like? Could you sketch it? And it's a real pain and to re-sketch it all the time, but you have uh, oh boy, I'm I'm running out of room. Free body diagram for joint a and you would have then this ax ay you have then this tension force going from a to c in what is the unit vector a to c this first unit vector is real important we're able to then pick off components the negative 3 over the square root of 72 i component or 6 over the square root of 72 in the j or square root of 27 or square root of 72 in the K. All right. And then you have this other member goes back that way. That's the force A to B. And then you have the force A to D. These are like known, known, true. You have three unknowns. You have a chance of doing the sum of the forces in the x at joint A must equal to zero. Sum of the forces in the y must equal to zero. Need to scoot down. Sum of the forces in the z must equal to zero. And you can solve. Three equations, three unknowns. You see that? Do I need to develop it or, or not? I feel like I'm losing you. Yeah, so... Right, we, we have the three-dimensional, and then you pick off the X component, Y component, Z component. Right? It's like uh, this, this is the equivalent of the sum of the forces at that equal to zero. One vector equation gives you three scalar equations. All right. Um, should we write the X equation or not? I'm sorry? Yeah, this is completely in the X. This is completely in the Y. And then the Z going up is not, FAD is not completely in the Z. Right, so let's write it for this one. So you would have AX plus AX. All right. Then what do I have? Nothing from the AY. How about the FAC? You're going to min put minus 3 divided by the square root of 72. You're picking off this component right here. This 3 divided by square root of 72. Ugh. 
times the force A to C. Okay, how about A to B? That'll be negative 1 times the force A to B because it's completely in the X. And then A to D, um, you're going to have the force A to D. It'll be negative, and I need to scoot up just a little bit. It'll be negative 1 half. So the unit vector from A to D is right here. We're going to go back 3i, no change in the y. We'll go up the square root of 27 in the k, and you take the square root of 3 squared plus the square root of 27 squared, which is 36. Square root of 36 comes in 6. That's how you get the negative 1 half. Perfect. Uh, there's a lot of steps in there. You did it pretty fast. That's pretty good. So it's negative 1 half equal to 0. There's your one equation. We, are, we, we have to have already solved for AX uh, from the global analysis of the constraints on our system. So you can also do the sum of the forces in the Y. You'll get an equation, sum of the forces Z. You'll get three equations and three unknowns. True? All right, let me do this. Let me go back and say we outlined how to solve for AX and AY and all of these. If you actually go ahead and solve for them, this uh, DZ comes in at 150 pounds. Let me just erase this. Leave some room in here. Sorry. 150 pounds. The AX comes in at zero. The AY is 86.6 pounds. The DX is zero. The DY is negative 173.2 pounds. I know that's four digits, but that's okay. And then the BY, 86 point six pounds and those signs are consistent with our illustration how did we get these over here again those are from analysis of the entire truss okay now what you can do is you can look at this 3d truss and it takes a little bit of work you can do just what i started doing joint a you get three equations three unknowns that's fine but could you get the, 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 the uh, force in a particular member? Let's focus on member B to C. This member B to C. How could I write an equation to get the, the, um, the force in member B to C? It would either be a moment balance for one of the axes that goes through one of the joints or multiple joints, or it would be a sum of the forces in a particular direction, X, Y, or Z, at a joint. Well, look at point B. Is this member D to B anything? Does it, play, does it come into the Y, or is it in the X, Z plane? It's in the X, Z plane. How about member X? A to B, is it in the XZ plane? It's confined to the XZ plane. Only at, at joint B, only the load BY is in the Y. It's 100% in the Y. And then some component of BC is in the Y. Do you see that? And so if I did, let me scroll, scroll up here. If I said for, uh, for joint B, if I said the equilibrium, sum of the forces in the y must equal to zero, that gives me one equation. There will be only one unknown with it. And so what we have is by times one is 100%. And then we have to pick off that component of the tension force going from B to C. All right. Well, that tension force from B to C, let me see if I can help you here. Um, Unit, what is the unit vector from B to C? What, what does it change going from B to C in the X? Isn't it plus 3? What does it change in the Y? Plus 6. And what does it change in the Z? Plus the square root of 27. And then you say, okay, what's 
3 squared plus 6 squared plus 27, square root of 72. True? Okay, let's scroll back up. Now I have that information because I need to pick up. That's 6 over square root of 72. That's that component. 6 divided by the square root of 72. Those are the only two players in the sum of the forces in the y equation for joint B. That's equal to 0. We calculate F B to C is now negative 122.5 pounds. What does the negative sign indicate? It's in compression. We then take a look at this and think, if I'm pulling down with the 150-pound force load on the end at C, doesn't it make sense that this, the 3D strut member B to C is in compression? Right? All right. If you also do at joint A in the Y direction, the same equation, you'll get that the force A to C is negative 122.5 pounds. It's also in compression and it's symmetrical. These two these two members right here are in compression. They're helping lift that load. All right, now if I come up to joint C, let's come up to joint C, and we do the sum of the forces in the Y. Actually, do I want to do the sum of the force? Yeah, the Y is pushing out in this direction some of the forces in the y we'll get that negative force uh, c to d because it's in tension the assume direction is backwards then we'll get you stay with the sign convention you'll get negative um, square uh, six divided by the square root of 72 times f B to C minus 6 square root of 72 um, times F uh, A to C. Those are pulling down. You're assuming the direction, their, their intention. That's equal to uh, 0. We put in two negative values. We just calculated, we put in negative 122.5 for both of those, and you calculate that the force uh, C to D is 173 pounds. It's a positive. What does that mean about it's in the state of tension? Did that make sense? So we've used um, looking at joint B, joint A, joint C, some of the forces in the Y, 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 and we solved for three of our unknowns. Let's go down here and check them off. We solved for uh, C to D, this one, so it's done. We solved for B to C, this one, done. And A to C, this one, done. All right. So how do we solve for uh, some of the others? Let's solve for... Uh, if you focus on joint uh, D, we already solved for dy, dz, and dx. I, I could solve for the member um, A to D right here. We know that it's symmetrical, right? It, we already found that it was symmetrical between these two. It'll be symmetrical between A to D and B to D as well. So they have the same magnitude. Okay, so if you do for joint um, D, the sum of the forces in the Z direction must equal to zero. You get that the DZ, let me scroll down, was solved to be 150 positive upward, 150 positive upward, and we're going to have two pulling down, they're going to pick off the component, the square root of 27, divided by 6 of the force A to D. And you solve for the force A to D, and that comes in at 86.6 .6 pounds, which is the same as the force 
uh, B to D, 86.6 pounds. There's, if you're skeptical about why is this symmetric, they have the same force in them, uh, you can go more slowly, but I'm running out of room and out of time. Uh, so that's those two are now solved for. B to D, solved for, and A to D. The last one is this member along axis X, the A to B member. So how do we do that one? Well, you can go back to, I'm going to run out of room. Ah, this is terrible. I'm so sorry. Do joint A, some of the forces in the X, and you will calculate that the force A to B is equal to zero. Any comments or questions? Thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you later.